The energy transition is something that affects all of our lives, but it's going to demand a huge amount of resources to make it happen. In this video, I'll explore the infrastructure and the technologies that are needed for the energy transition and the resources required to build them. The 8 billion people on Earth consume almost 180,000 terawatts hours of energy annually. All the things we use and do on a daily basis require energy, industry, transport, heating and so on. As of 2022, fossil fuels still make up over 80% of global energy production and that percentage has not changed very much in the past 20 years. Energy transition means moving away from hydrocarbons-based energy production towards lower carbon methods for generating the energy that we all need in our everyday lives. So what are these infrastructure and technologies that allow us to generate that energy with minimal carbon emissions? There are three aspects to the electricity infrastructure, energy production, energy storage and transport, and end user technologies. Let's look at the energy production first. There are many technologies that will contribute to the low-carbon energy mix, such as geothermal, nuclear, hydrogen and hydro or tidal power, but the energy sources that are among the easiest and fastest to harness are wind and sun. So what do we need to build these? Well, take one wind turbine like this to start with. A wind turbine consists of three main components. The tower, which forms the body of the turbine, the rotor blades to produce the kinetic energy, and the nacelle, which houses the generator converting the kinetic energy to electrical energy. To build a single turbine, a range of materials are needed, particularly metals. The single most important material to make a wind turbine up to 79% is steel. Steel is an alloy made up mostly of iron, with many other metals added to improve the corrosion resistance and durability of the alloy. Chromium is one of the most important metals in the alloy, but many other elements such as manganese, cobalt, nickel, titanium, phosphorus and vanadinium are usually also added. Steel also needs some coal to improve its strength, although research is going on into using other elements instead, so hopefully coal won't be needed in the future. The generator within the nacelle contains some steel but also a wide array of other metals. The most common wind turbine generator type is the so-called permanent magnet generator, which requires magnetic steel and copper. But in addition, these wind turbines need elements such as neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium and terbium. The rotor blades are usually made of composite materials meaning things like plastic derived from hydrocarbons or fiberglass, which is mostly made out of quartz and aluminium oxides. And of course, you need a lot of copper for wind turbines, about three and a half tons per megawatt, in fact, to build the cabling, wiring and transformers. Globally, it has been estimated that building wind energy will demand a total of five and a half million tonnes of copper between 2018 and 2028. In addition to metals, a wind turbine also requires aggregates, so non-metallic materials such as gravel. The platform onto which the wind turbine is placed needs concrete, 
which is made of sand, gravel and cement consisting of carbonate-rich powder and gypsum. Building a platform is relatively simple for turbines built on land, but in other cases things get much more complicated. Well that thing in the horizon, that's an offshore wind farm and that thing is a whole different beast altogether. They are huge, even though they appear quite small from the distance. And those things need to be, of course, anchored onto the sea bottom. This anchoring requires a whole new set of infrastructure, such as these anchoring towers being built in Cromarty in the north of Scotland. And this, of course, requires more materials, particularly steel. Also, an offshore wind farm uses a lot more copper than an onshore one, where an onshore wind farm needs about three and a half tons of copper per megawatt, an offshore one needs almost three times that, about nine and a half tons per megawatt. So, all sorts of metals needed then for wind turbines. But what about solar power? What do we need to build solar panels and solar farms? Well, solar panels are an important part of the energy mix, even in Northern Europe. For example, here in Scotland, you quite often come across little solar farms like this one here in Aberdeenshire. A solar panel consists of several photovoltaic cells that capture the energy of sunlight, transforming it into electricity. A panel has a metal frame, mostly made out of aluminium. The front of the solar panel consists of glass, made mostly out of silicon, whilst the back is usually made out of plastics. The photovoltaic cells under the front panel are soldered together and connected using metals such as silver, zinc, copper and tin. The cells themselves also contain silicon and various thin film and semiconducting materials such as cadmium, gallium, arsenic, tellurium, lead, indium, selenium and antimony. And again, you need copper for the heat exchangers, cabling and wiring. About 5.5 tons of copper is needed for each megawatt produced in a solar power system. But producing the energy is just the first step the electricity needs to be either stored or transmitted and distributed to the end users. In some cases, for example, if you have a set of solar panels on your roof, that transport distance is short and doesn't need that much more resources. But if that energy is produced in a solar farm or a wind farm, a whole new infrastructure needs to be built in order to transport that energy to the consumer. That means building new grid infrastructure with transformer stations and cabling networks to connect to the new energy farms both onshore and offshore. This is a huge task that again requires a vast amount of metals and minerals most importantly, steel, copper and concrete. But the rate and the nature of energy production can be varied. The sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow, not even here in Scotland. This means that the energy produced needs to be stored somewhere so that it can be fed into the grid at those times when primary production can't cover the demand. These storage solutions are still being developed, 
but they are likely to involve things like batteries, thermal storage, or hydroelectric storage. All of these will require various metals and minerals. Well, the third part of the equation is the energy distribution at the point of use, whether it's for us regular customers or for the industry. And a good example of that is the charging stations for electric vehicles and all the infrastructure that we need to build to provide those. A charging station requires many metals, most importantly copper, steel, aluminium, nickel, chromium and titanium. Charging stations and the electric vehicles themselves also have batteries which contain all sorts of metals, including lithium. Battery technologies continue to be increasingly important in the energy transition and I will talk about the battery metals in particular in a separate video. But as we've seen, just building the low carbon energy infrastructure requires a wide array of metals and elements. And now the question of course arises, where do all these metals come from? But that I'll talk about in other videos.